Any other comments at this point or questions? Yes, ma'am. I guess one of the main or passages that makes me feel like it's impossible to get to that point is in Romans 7 where Paul says, I do what I right. don't want to do. And just understanding, like Paul, who was so right. advanced and could be content and mm -hmm. all things still had that struggle. And so. So you didn't go on to Romans 8? <laughs> Remember Romans 8? Now there's a systematic body of interpretation of Romans 8 that cuts its tie to Romans 7. Because Romans 8 proceeds to talk about exactly what Romans 7 was about. There is therefore now no condemnation. And they read that as forgiveness. There's no guilt. And those who are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit, for the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set me free from the law of sin and death. Now, what was Romans 7 complaining about? The law of sin and death. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled, and you interpret that positionally, having to do with forgiveness, so the law is fulfilled in you that in the sense that now the price has been paid for all of your sins. See, the interpretation of that passage that most people have leaves them stuck in Romans 7. And they don't look at Paul's actual life and see that he didn't live in Romans 7. He didn't live there. He's talking about a passage of life in which he found that he could not, by his wonderful ideals and principles, as a Pharisee and sincere follower of the law, he could not do it. But now, it's really important that you brought this up, dear, because, you know, this is one of the things that sort of hangs over us. And there's a deep truth in it, because you cannot do this in your own strength. You can't do it. It's absolutely impossible. But glory be to God, you don't have to live in your own strength. In fact, you were not even made to do that. You were made to live in the strength of God. See, we needed grace before we sinned. Adam was living by grace. Now, I know that's twisting your categories a bit, I'm afraid, but think, you know, think the thought. If, we hadn't, if man had never sinned, they would have lived by grace. So now you have to get grace over here where it has to do with life and not with failure. The point of grace is not to patch up failures, though it does that. It is to give you the life you were meant for. And that life is seen in Genesis 1.26. You know, the Bible does not begin at Genesis 3. The story is not, it does not begin at the fall. It begins at creation. Okay, now I'll throw out a lot of things like that. You may want to come back and talk about them or you may want to respond immediately. Uh, but these are really the fundamental issues because in the minds of most people, let me tell you a story about renovation of the heart. When it first came out, the people who had to represent the books to the booksellers, the bookstores, could not represent it to them because it suggested it was actually possible not to live a life of defeat. And they were so hung up on the idea that that was Romans 7 is the story of the Christian life. Real life story, right here in Colorado. <laughs> But you see, it's reflective of this attitude that you're meant to live in defeat. 
Now, let's once and for all say that we're not talking about perfection in any legalistic terms. Because you are finite and you live in a world that's going to tear you to pieces at every chance it gets, you better not plan on that. At least you won't need to worry about it for a while. <laughs> so you focus on particular things, the things that Jesus taught and learning how to do that. And legalistic perfection does not matter anyway because we've already been ruined on that count. And that is one thing where grace has to come in and say what God in effect said to Abraham. Abraham, you're a goof up. But you trust me and I'd rather have that. Abraham believed God and God counted that as righteousness. Now that meant that God resumed his relationship with Abraham on a different basis and a better one. By the way, do you remember what God, what Abraham believed God for? You remember the story well enough? What did Abraham believe God for? Believe God for a baby, a male heir. That's the issue. And it was a big one because this was going to be a miracle. And Abraham's life with Isaac is one of miracle, of trusting God for what was impossible. See, that's what, that's the trust that stands as the basis of your relationship and my relationship to God. That's trust, that's reliance on the kingdom. Now we come to the kingdom through Jesus. We had to talk a lot about that because if you got kingdom without Jesus, you ain't got the kingdom. And if you got Jesus without the kingdom, why worry about whether you got Jesus? Because the king usually does not come without his kingdom. And so the picture of Jesus as the sacrificial victim alone is not accurate. It's not accurate. That's why the resurrection is so important. And Paul says, you remember in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ is not risen, your faith is in vain. You are still in your sins. Now that's a verse that we need to think deeply about because that's what we're talking about, getting out of our sins. If the only issue was Christ's suffering on our behalf, to get our guilt taken care of, you will not find any place for the resurrection. It will become an addendum of some sort. But if you understand that redemption includes your life now, and that that comes through your union with the risen Christ and his kingdom, then you can see the broader picture that Paul is talking about. If Christ is not risen, he's not a part of my life. If he's not a part of my life, I can't deal with it. And I am stuck in Romans 7 with all the right beliefs and total inability to deal with life. <laughs>